today is Father's Day. Can we give our fathers a hand? Show our appreciation today. Well, I want to talk to you on this thought, how to be the best dad ever. Now, I realize that some of you will be like, well, I'm not a dad. Uh, I'm a woman. I'm not a dad, or I'm not married, or I don't have kids yet. Well, this message is for you because we're showing you how to live in a way that pleases God with your life. And so it, it truly is for everybody. But today we're going to really focus on talking to fathers. Did you know this? Studies show that fathers, this is kind of surprising, fathers have the greatest influence on their children more than any other person or thing in the world. Now, it would seem like mothers would have the greatest influence, and mothers do have a great influence, don't get me wrong. Now, fathers, the survey shows that, uh, the study shows that fathers can have a good or a bad influence. So sometimes they have a great influence for bad on their children. But fathers, you have a tremendous influence on your children. It doesn't just happen when they're little or when they're teenagers. It happens all their life. And so no matter what it was like when your kids were little, maybe you got saved later in life. And you say, well, you know, my kids are grown, and I don't know if I can have that much influence on them at this point or not. But you can. You will be able to have an influence. Your faith matters. Your faithfulness matters. What you do, what you believe, what you say, it matters. And I want you to know that we need you. Dads, we need you in the home. We need you in the church. We need you in the culture. And I might be so bold as to say, I believe a great reason, maybe one of the primary reasons that we see what we see in our culture today, so many that don't respect God, so many that don't respect uh, each other, so many that don't respect the law. And, and we could just go down the list. But I believe that is in a great part because so many fathers have been separated from the home, separated from the culture, and as a result, separated from the great influence in their children's lives and the lives of others. And so we need you. It's very important. I will say this. I, I spoke to my dad this morning. My dad's almost 80 years old. And, um, you know, I, I guess you can clap for that. I, you know, I, I'm sure he would be happy about that, you know. Uh, but I, I do know that my dad had a great influence on me. And I want to just tell you a real quick story about my dad. Um, when I was a, a young kid, my dad was very, very unhealthy in his lifestyle. Drank a lot. He not only smoked cigarettes, but he also smoked a pipe and chewed tobacco and dipped snuff. And I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding when I say this. I've actually seen him with a cigarette and a chew of tobacco and a dip of snuff all at the same time. And I'm like, that dude needs a nicotine fix, all right? So, but my dad was uh, very unhealthy. He'd gotten really overweight. And uh, he decided that he was going to do something about it. So he began to, de he decided he was going to quit smoking and all that. And he was going to start running. And uh, the first time he ever ran, he ran one mile. That was his goal. He wanted to run one mile. You got to keep in mind, this was the late 60s, early 70s uh, in North Carolina. Nobody really did that. You know, if they saw you running down the side of the road, they just assumed that you had, uh, you know, gotten really scared or stolen something, all right? So uh, my dad would run and people would stop. My dad's name's Roger. They'd say, Roger, what's wrong? He's like, nothing, I'm just trying to run. Why are you trying to run? Well, anyway, the first mile he ran, he literally had to crawl the last part of it into our yard. And I saw my dad begin to do this, and he began to get better at it, and he began to lose weight, he began to get really healthy, and uh, it began to influence me. I guess when I was around eight years old, I started running with my dad. We lived out in the country, and uh, there was this big old loop 
uh, gravel road that I would run. It was about, one loop was about a mile. And so my dad would run anywhere from three to five miles, and I would run one mile. And so it became a thing, okay? And my dad got really, really good at it. In fact, he has estimated that from his early 20s until he turned 60, he ran over 38,000 miles in his life. That's one and a half times around the earth, okay? That's a lot of running. Well, anyway, my dad, being the kind of person that he is, um, he decided that he was going to give me a gift. Now, you said, what gift was he going to give you? Well, I'll tell you. My dad told me that when I, was, when I turned 13 on my 13th birthday, the gift that he was going to give me was this. That if I could not outrun him for three miles, he was going to run behind me with a belt and just whack me the entire way. Now, look, I did not think he was serious about it. I did run. I got pretty good at it. And I could run faster and further than him. And so I didn't think anything about it. But on my 13th birthday, on that day, my dad said, are you ready for your gift? And I'm like, and I'd forgotten all about that. I was like, yes, I would love a gift. And so he said, all right, get out on the road. And I had no idea what he was doing. And he said, go. And then for, I'm not kidding, probably for 100 yards, he went behind me just whacking me with a belt. And I've often thought, I wonder what the neighbors thought that I did, all right, that made my dad chase me down the side of the road. Now, just some of you I know are your... You're horrified at that story. Uh, he was just teasing. It was not a big deal. Uh, we had a lot of fun with it. I've laughed about it quite a bit, okay? And then recently, my dad had to have hip replacement surgery. And I thought to myself, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. All right, so, but no, that was my dad. And, uh, he has been a great, great influence for me and on me. And I believe this. Um, I've learned many valuable lessons in life today because of my dad. I learned the work ethic. I learned to be determined. I learned not to quit. Um, I learned to be honest. I learned to pay my bills. I, I learned to have character. My dad had a great, great influence on me. In fact, I would say this. I am a Christian today. I know because of Jesus, I get that. But because of my father, I'm a pastor today because of my father. And he had tremendous, tremendous influence on me. And I just want to say publicly, and I told him this morning that I love him and that I'm very thankful for what influence he's had in my life. Well, today I want to read to you from the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to talk about ways to be the best dad ever. And if you're not a dad, this still applies to you, how to live your life in a way that is pleasing to God. So we're going to begin reading in Mark chapter 9 and verse 38. And here it says, John said to him, now who was John? That was one of the apostles, one of the disciples. He wrote the gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He wrote the book of Revelation. Now, interesting about John, uh, he was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, but he had a brother named James. Did you know that Jesus nicknamed these two brothers, James and John, he called them the Sons of Thunder. Now you say, well, that was a cool name. No, it wasn't. It was an insult. Why did he call them the Sons of Thunder? Because they had such harsh tempers and they overreacted to almost everything. Oh, there go the Sons of Thunder. And the point was that they couldn't control their emotions. They really uh, were out of control in some ways. They were not very easy to get along with. Interestingly, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and John was so changed, he, like I said, wrote the Gospel of John, wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, wrote the book of Revelation. Do you know what he began to be called after the resurrection of Jesus Christ? It wasn't Sons of Thunder anymore. It was called the disciple whom Jesus loved, or the beloved disciple. Now, how do you go from a person that has no control over his temper, 
that has no control over his outburst to be knowing be, to be known for your love. Well, I'll tell you how. It's by meeting Jesus. It's by having the transformation power that only Jesus can work in your life. So John said to him, talking to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Do you get the idea that he was not yet the disciple of love? I mean, he saw somebody that was doing a good thing. They were casting out demons. But he said, Jesus, stop these people because they're not following us. Notice he didn't say they weren't following Jesus. He was concerned about himself, concerned about his reputation. He was concerned about his denomination. He was concerned about his team and no one else. Well, that is the way that some people live. But he said, this guy is not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me for the one who is not against us is for us. Notice that Jesus was claiming here to be the focal point, not a denomination, not a petty doctrine, not some little thing that you differ with somebody over. Did you know that the majority of Christians are not fully unified because of petty things? It's not because of the main things. It's not because of Jesus. It's not because that they don't believe that salvation comes through faith alone and Christ alone. It's not that. It's little silly things. It's styles of music. It's little non-essential beliefs. I know people that will just literally lose their mind because one group of people believes in speaking in tongues and the other does not. It's not important. And I'm not suggesting that anything that the Bible teaches is not important. But what I'm saying is you've got to learn to keep the main thing, the main thing. And it's about Jesus. It's about putting Jesus at the center, not these little trivial differences. He says, for truly I say to you, whoever gives a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So what he's doing is he's taking and showing that even little bitty acts of service matter. Do you get the idea that he wants you to serve? He says even little things will get a reward. He said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it will be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, keep in mind, in uh, previous times, he, he had taken a child and set it in the midst, and he called that child a little one. He was not talking about children here. He was talking about his followers. This was really a metaphor, a figure of speech about people that were followers of Jesus. He said, if anyone causes them to sin, in other words, causes them to fall away, causes them to be, uh, in some places it uses the word offended. Now, that doesn't mean what you think it means. We get the word offended. Well, you know, he said something uh, to me that wasn't very kind. That offended me. That's not what that word means in this context. The idea of being offended means that you fall away. If you cause someone else to stop following Jesus, that's what he's saying. Maybe it causes them to stop going to church altogether. or Maybe it causes them to stop serving altogether. He says, if you do anything that causes this, he says, you'd be better off if you had a millstone. You know what that is? It's a big, giant stone they used to grind grain. Most of the time that day, they were probably eight feet tall. So it's not like he was just saying you get a pocket full of rocks and jump in the lake. He's saying that it would be better for you to be drowned in the ocean than to do that. That's what he's saying. Pretty harsh. He says, and then he goes on, and then he presses this even further, okay? Because I want you to see how much... He used hyperbole here to show a point of how important it is that we follow Jesus, that we serve him. Here's what he said. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Well, that's pretty radical. For it's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell. Well, I'd have to say that's true, right? 
I mean, it's better to go to heaven with one hand than to go to hell with two. But he says, um, go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, Jesus here was using hyperbole to make the point that you've got to guard against. Now, get this. This is two points he's making. Guard against causing others to sin, to fall away, to leave the faith, and guard against causing yourself to do that. So do you get the point? He's saying, he's showing this as a symbiotic relationship, that you've got to have this relationship with Jesus Christ, but also in the church, that you've got to do everything in your power to encourage people to serve God, but also do everything in your power to protect your own decision-making, to protect your own choices that you make to serve God. He's saying it's pretty serious. He's saying that, it would be better for you to cut off a hand than not serve him. It would be better for you to pluck out an eye than not serve him. It would be better for you to cough a foot than not to serve him. Now, once again, is Jesus suggesting that you should pluck out your eye just because you gave somebody an evil eye? No, he's not. He's saying He's showing this that no matter the cost, no matter how extreme people think it is, you must serve the Lord. That's what he's saying. Now, the interesting thing is that he said, the example he gave here was that it's better to enter life, and he's talking about eternal life in heaven, with one hand than to go to hell where the fire's not quenched. And their worm dies not. That's a weird thing to say, isn't it? Their worm does not die. Well, what does that mean? Well, the Greek word for hell is the word Gehenna, which comes from the Hinnom Valley. And every person that was listening to Jesus' voice at that time knew exactly what that meant. You see, uh, during uh, ancient Israel, they if you read the Old Testament, you know that many times... They would serve the Lord, and then they would drift away, and they would begin to serve idols. And some became so bad about this that they even uh, literally began to serve Molech. Now, you've probably read about Baal and Molech. Molech was uh, an Assyrian god, and you know what they did? They sacrificed humans to this god. Now, think about this. These were people that believed in God. They believed in Yahweh. They believed that there was one true God, but they got so distracted and so off course, and they got so wrapped up in idolatry that they literally, these are Jewish people, they literally began to offer their babies as human sacrifices to Molech. I can't even imagine that. Well, this was under King Ahaz, and later under King Josiah. He was a king that loved the Lord, and he got rid of all of these idols. He got rid of Baal. He got rid of Molech and, and all these other uh, false idols. And in fact, he became so zealous about the Lord. Here's what he did. He turned the Hinnom Valley into a garbage dump. And what he did, because they had offered human sacrifices there... He set it on fire, and it is said that in that region for years, and even in the time of Jesus, that there was still smoke coming up from the Hinnom Valley, where they had turned it into a garbage dump, and people would literally dump their garbage, and they would set things on fire, and literally to go to hell was synonymous here with their worm not dying and the fire not being quenched. What does it mean their worm didn't die? Well, I think that refers to the putrid nature of hell. I think it refers to the fact that 
in this garbage dump, in this hell fire uh, that people could literally see with their lives, that the worm never died. There would never be an end to the torture. There would never be an end uh, to the pain. And as a result, the fire was not quenched. Now, could that represent a person's conscience never dying? A person that dies, rejects Christ, goes to hell, that they're always aware? I think that is one of the most torturous aspects of hell, is that you will know that you had a chance and you didn't take it. That you would know that you could have been saved, that you could have been right with God, and you chose not to be. And I think that is one of the most torturous things about hell. I believe hell's a real place. I believe that the Bible is very clear about that. But I also believe that in this case, uh, that there's a metaphor here about what hell is like, that what happens is that uh, there is great pain and great suffering. And his point is this, don't miss this. That it is better for you to go to the extreme to get rid of what is going to cause you to go to hell than it would to be, and, and go to heaven with one hand, one eye, one foot, rather than to go to hell and be complete in your body. That's what he's saying. And what he's showing us is that you need to be willing, if necessary, to go to great lengths, to go to great lengths to serve God. Well, he goes on, he says, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its salt, saltiness, how will you make it salty again? And then he says this, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Next week, I'm going to talk about those last two verses in detail about uh, we'll be tested with salt or by fire. And uh, to have salt in ourselves. But there are three principles here in this passage that I want to give you quickly uh, that Jesus taught his disciples about following him. And these three principles are true for us today. And here's principle number one disciples serve. That's what Jesus is saying. No matter what it takes, no matter how great the effort, I mean, once again, plucking out an eye, cutting off a hand, cutting off a foot. That's pretty extreme, wouldn't you say? And Jesus was showing us that no matter how difficult you may find it, no matter how much it seemed that you had to go to great lengths or great effort, that as a disciple, you must serve God. Now, why is that? What was Jesus showing? Well, I think he was showing us that all people matter to God. And this idea that when you become a Christian, you just kind of, you know, you get in and it's a fire insurance policy. You don't have to go to hell. And that's a wonderful thing about salvation. But God did not offer salvation to you simply for you to fill some skin for a few years. He didn't say, here, uh, have a blessed life without any cost of discipleship. Now, make no mistake, salvation is free. It is a free gift of God. It is not of your works. It's not because you're good. It's because Jesus is good. Okay? But I want you to understand that people matter to God. And the reason he wants us to go to such great lengths to serve him is because he's interested in people. He loves people. I, I believe that um, I'm going to be held accountable for my service to God. You know why I serve I know that one, yeah, there are a lot of blessings, okay? But I know ultimately one day I'm going to stand before God. And I'm going to give an account. Now, once again, I'm not going to give an account for my salvation. Jesus has already assured that. But you know what I will give an account for? With what I did with what he gave me. What will you give an account for? Well, I guarantee it's for serving. Disciples serve. And then... I believe that we get this principle, and this is the motive, you know, it's the positive and negative. The negative side is I'm going to be held accountable. The positive is that even imperfect service is rewarded. Do you get that? He said, if you even do so simple as give a cup of water in my name, you're going to receive a reward for it. Do you get the idea that Jesus is passionate 
about a relationship with you. He is passionate about your making a difference in the kingdom of God. Well, today's Father's Day. I can remember when my kids were little. I would make such a big deal out of things that today are pretty normal. I mean, when my kids took their first step, I was all cheering and uh, just all excited and letting everybody know. And the fact is, when you're a father or a mother and your kid does something, they're growing, they're doing something good, man, you get all excited for them, don't you? Why would you think our Heavenly Father would be any different? He said, if you even do something as simple as give a cup of water in the name of Jesus, you're going to receive a reward for it. Look, when I was, uh, when my kids were little, we would brag and talk about the silliest things. For those of you that have children, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You got pumped, excited. You shared with people. You shared details about the first time that your baby pooped. And I'll be honest, I don't care to know about when your baby poops, okay? And neither does anybody else. But you know what that shows? That as a parent, you are so into anything that that kid does, you're excited about it. Even when they poop in their diaper, okay? Now, the same is true of our Heavenly Father. He wants us to serve. He says we need to go to extreme lengths. We've got to be willing to do that. But even the littlest thing, he's going to honor and he's going to reward. So get involved. Disciples serve. And then disciples defend. They defend the faith family. I hope you will do that, uh, that you'll defend your faith family, that you'll not be the person that tears down the church, but rather that builds up. You'll not be the person that throws the barbs, but you'll be the person that shields from the barbs. Do you get what I'm saying? So you got to defend your faith family. You got to defend with passion. Um, the idea here is that I need to serve God with passion. Would you say that it would be very passionate if a person was so committed to serving God that if they thought their eye was going to bother them, they would pluck it out? I'd say that person's pretty committed, wouldn't you? I mean, I would call that zealous. I would call that maybe misguided. I would call that something I don't want to do. But once again, Jesus was using hyperbole. He was not suggesting you should go rip out your eyes. What he's saying is this, that you've got to be willing to do what other people consider extreme. I want you to think about that. You've got to be willing to do what others would consider to be extreme to serve God. Did you know that some people are going to think, if you go to church every week, that's extreme. Some people are going to think, well, man, that person gives. That church is just after your money. That's all they're after. Don't you recognize that? Don't you realize that? They would consider that extreme. Uh, if you spend your free time, and I'm not just talking about Sunday morning, but let's say you do what we're asking you to do, which is to serve God. You get here early. You serve on a Sunday. You practice during the week. You learn a lesson during the week. You go to a small group during the week. It doesn't matter. The fact is, some people would look at you and say, are you nuts? Are you crazy? Are, are you brainwashed? Is that a cult down there? Are they trying to take all of your money and all of your free time? What is the point? The point is, we've got to be willing to do what others would consider extreme in order to serve God. By the way, we celebrate extreme people. Now, I know that we can see extremists and maybe there's a, a cult leader that's an extremist. We don't celebrate that. But in life, do you know what we do? We celebrate extremism a lot. How many have ever heard of Michael Jordan, the basketball player? Raise your hand, okay? He's been retired for a long time. Uh, but Michael Jordan, in my opinion, is probably the greatest basketball player ever lived. But let me tell you this. Listen. The man was not normal. And I don't mean just from his talent. He was six foot six, uh, which is not overly big for the NBA. Uh, but he was extreme in his commitment. This man was beyond, I don't know if you ever 
uh, watched some of the documentaries about him and his family, uh, his, uh, his basketball family, and, and, and what he required of people. Uh, it got to a point where even his teammates didn't like him that much because he was so demanding. Why was that? He was extreme, extreme. He was extremely committed, and he was not happy if you didn't share his level of commitment and you were on his team. You say, what was the result? Became the greatest basketball player ever, arguably. Became a billionaire. Became the owner of an NBA team. Became so famous... I mean, he's 60 years old now, and people all across the world still know his name. We celebrate that. We say, yay for Michael Jordan. But can I tell you something? Michael Jordan was one of the most extreme individuals that I've ever even heard about. And you know what Jesus is saying? You've got to be willing to make a commitment that may seem extreme to other people. But it's worth it. It is worth it. And yes, some people may misunderstand, but the point is you've got to have this passion for serving God and defending your reputation, your faith. Uh, There have been some extreme commitments that I've made in my life. Uh, One was my wedding vows. I mean, think about how extreme that is. Keeping myself to you only as long as we both shall live. It's pretty extreme. I don't think anybody thinks that's too extreme. I don't think anybody is upset over that level of commitment. They say that what they say is, yes, that's what you should do. Pretty extreme, right? In fact, I've even made the extreme decision in my ministry that I will not get in a car or go to a restaurant uh, alone with a woman who's not my wife. I just don't do it. Um, you say, well, why? Because I've made an extreme commitment, not only to my wife, but to the church. Now, God knows that there are enough shortcomings in my life uh, to fill up a stadium. But I'll tell you this, I am extreme in the way that I guard myself. You say, why is that? Because it's worth it. I'll tell you this, uh, my assistant a number of years ago, her name was Katrina, And she was within literally less than a half a mile from our church office. And she was broken down on the side of the road. And I was driving right by her. So I stopped. I said, Katrina, what's wrong? My car broke down. And I looked at it. I was a half a mile. She was my assistant. I was alone in the car. She was alone. You say, so did you give her a ride to the office? Absolutely not. You say, well, that's mean. Well, it may have been, but I told her, and I explained to her, I said, Katrina, wait right here, and I'm going to send somebody back. Either I'm going to send somebody back, or I'm going to get somebody to ride with me to come down here and take you to the office. And so we did, and we got her car uh, towed and worked on, and it worked out. You say, well, do you think that it would have been a sin for you to give your assistant a ride for a half a mile? No, not at all. In fact, it probably would have been a good thing to do. Would it be a sin for me to eat lunch alone with a woman who's not my wife or a member of my family? No, it would not be a sin. But you know what? I have made such a commitment that what I have committed to may seem extreme to some people. And I'm okay with that. Why? Because I've made an extreme commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean that I don't sin? Does that mean that I don't ever fail? No. But you know what it does mean? That I would rather enter into the presence of God with one eye than to go to hell. Not that I'm going to go to hell. You understand, I'm not talking about a works-based salvation here. Okay? But what I'm talking about is that Jesus uses this to show us you need to be willing to be extreme. From time to time, it's okay. Well, let me close with this. Disciples endure. He said everyone will be salted with fire. I'm actually going to talk about this next week. I'm not going to talk about it right now. And so if you want to hear that, you'll have to come next week and, uh, and listen to the rest of that, okay? But here's the thing. Are you being a true disciple of Jesus Christ? 
Are you serving? Are you defending? Are you willing to go to the extreme, if necessary, to serve the Lord? Now think about this. In our culture, um, it, it's, not, it's not very popular to go to extremes, especially for something that's good, something that's right. There will be people that misunderstand. There will be people that mock you. But I want you to understand what Jesus is saying here. It's worth it. It's worth it. When you serve God, it is worth the price. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help all of us to follow you, to serve you, and to do what Jesus gave us this example that we're willing to serve, that we're willing to commit, that we're willing to step up, we're willing to do what is necessary. Why don't you just look right this way for a second? I, I was going to talk to you while your head's bowed, but you might get a crick in your neck. All right, so um, dads, moms, everyone, listen. You know that each week I like to give people an opportunity to respond to the gospel. I had someone point out to me this week, and I appreciated this because I, I was actually already thinking about it. They said, you know, you've talked recently about salvation, but you haven't mentioned sins. Let me, let, me, let me tell you what the Bible says. It is impossible to be saved until you acknowledge that you need to be saved. And what, what does that mean? It means that you admit that you're a sinner. Did you know that Jesus, the first sentence of the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know what that word means? That word poor doesn't mean you're broke or you need to borrow five dollars. What it means is that you are completely abject. You're completely broken. You're completely helpless apart from someone else's help. And that's the picture of coming to Jesus Christ for salvation. You cannot come for salvation if you don't admit that you need salvation. You cannot come to be forgiven if you do not admit that your sins separate you from God and need to be forgiven. I mean, think about this. Most people rarely admit that they sin, rarely admit that they're wrong. I mean, we all like to talk about how good we are. Oh, you know what? When I die, God knows I'm a moral person. God knows how good I am. And when I get to heaven, and I've heard so many people say this, uh, God's going to weigh the good against the bad, and I believe the good's going to outweigh the bad, and God's going to let me into heaven. Well, if that's what you do, I got some really bad news for you. You might want to get an asbestos suit, okay, because you ain't going to heaven with that attitude. You say, well, what does it mean to be saved? Well, it means to come to Christ, admit that you need salvation. Admit that you need redemption. Admit that you need forgiveness. And by doing that, you say, Jesus, I'm not trusting in me or my goodness or my good works, but I'm trusting in you and your finished work on the cross. That is, when you trust Jesus by faith, the only possible way of salvation. You don't get saved because you go to church. You don't get saved because you want a, a blessed life. And I believe in a blessed life. But that's not why you get saved. Look, I, I know that you know, we can get a little too off in the weeds in this, but listen closely. I didn't understand everything when I got saved. I was only eight years old. I couldn't explain theology to you. But there's one thing that I knew. The Holy Spirit was convicting me, even as an eight-year-old boy, that I needed Jesus. That I needed forgiveness, that I needed salvation. Otherwise, I was convinced from the top of my eight-year-old head to the bottom of my eight-year-old feet that if I did not receive Christ by faith, that I was going to go to hell. And so I want to challenge you today. Maybe today you'd say, Pastor, I need salvation. I need Jesus. Well, I hope you'll pray, and I'm not even going to lead you in a prayer, but just tell the Lord that you need forgiveness, that you want to love him, that you want him to come into your life and save you. And the Bible says he will. And just take your card and mark it on there that you want salvation today. And um, 
I, I, I want you to know that God loves you, that Jesus will save you, and you've got to come to him and ask. And he will. He will. He promises that he will. Ushers, would you come? I'm excited. We have no men taking up the offering today. You know what that means? That means you're going to give a great offering because don't you love these lovely ladies up here? All right, so uh, drop in your next step card. While they're passing that, don't forget, you can go and you can uh, get some tickets, okay, for the Braves tickets. You can buy those. Um, let, let me tell you this. I'm excited about this. On July 21st, I am going to be in South Africa. Lord willing, if the plane arrives properly, I'm going to be in South Africa. What I'm doing is I'm going to represent you, and uh, we're going to take these children in this children's village, and we're going to take them out and buy the things that they need with money that you've given, and we're going to buy the caretakers the things that they need with the money that you've given in this offering. And... Uh, the good news is I'm going to film it, and in fact, what we're going to do is on that Sunday, on that Sunday, I'm going to come to you live from South Africa, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the village, we're going to let everybody see what it looks like, it's beautiful, and then we're going to meet Bob Graham, which you've met, um, we're going to meet some of the caretakers uh, some of these are new and you haven't met them before. We're going to meet some of the caretakers that take care of the kids. And uh, then you're going to get to see all the kids. Now, some of them are grown now, graduating high school. And there are about 10 or 11 of them that are brand new, just younger uh, in the program there. And so I'll be speaking to you live and I'll be uh, showing you all that and uh, interviewing some of them. And then I'll give you a very brief message at the very end, okay? So that'll be our message for July 21st. We're going to do one service, 11 o'clock, and I hope you'll be here for that, okay? Well, don't forget that uh, you can get those tickets on the way out. Um, I love you. Thank you for being here today. God bless you. Happy Father's Day. We'll see you next Sunday.